good afternoon everybody and welcome to our session of uh, the vision pack series i am vidyat joshi and i'm going to be your host for this session so it's uh, good to be with you yet again for another session happy that all of you uh, you know spared the time to attend our session today so i know being a parent is one of the toughest job so it said but uh, you know it can be one of the best jobs also in the world uh, if we know exactly how to positively influence your child's development so th a little thought that i would like to share with you today it's actually a quote it's a quote from a very famous child psychologist many maybe you you have heard of him uh, he is haim ginot so he said in some situations with children what you should do is don't just do something stand there you know that's a very amazing statement uh, i'll just say it again don't just do something stand there what he meant is it's it's really amazing what happens when you you know sort of take the time to put yourself in the role of a scientist okay who is observing your subject's behavior like a parent who's the, got the role of a scientist and you're observing your child's behavior who's your uh, subject so it's worth thinking of parenting you know you might have heard it's parenting is an art parenting is an art but i also believe if you look at it like this parenting is a science so so i so i urge you all to you know put on your observation hats and really observe your children you will learn a lot from what they are trying to tell us just by their behavior so i'm sure you enjoyed our last session if you remember it was with uh, dipali merja it was a art and craft session and today happens to be our 16th session so just a quick recap of what we have gone through just so that you know uh, you know what we've been doing so we'd gone through this physical uh, fitness then we had emotional and social intelligence then there was a you know a storytelling session a flash card session then we had a we addressed the preschool question then positive parenting uh then we had uh, baby movements to expert skills we also had a, a early language development session we looked at the post pandemic recovery then teething and beyond and of course uh, the last one which was a mother and toddler session so today is coos babbles and beyond it's the role of parents in supporting early speech development right uh i hope i'm audible everybody is able to hear me and see me well yeah yes okay thank you so let me just continue then so as i was saying um you know the human language uh this faculty is a remarkable gift that is uh given to us by nature so you might be surprised or may not be also there are almost 6000 different languages in this world and uh, just like how uh, walking is expected of young children everywhere talking in sentences so that adults can understand them that is also a given and due to this fact that babies can do it we assume that this very universal achievement is is simple actually quite the contrary it's this language acquisition is a very highly complex and evolved task yeah it is the and it's actually the babies because they seem to be doing it they are the ones who make it appear simple why because babies are geniuses so um having said this i would just like to draw your attention to a little fact that there are three terms which we always use interchangeably you know there's communication language and speech okay so let's just try to understand there's a subtle difference between uh, these three so when you say communication it refers what does it refer to it's the you know it's the exchange of uh, ideas informations it's even the needs and and a desire between the participants that's what is communication and now language it is the tool by which we kind of write or we understand and speech that's the tool for communication which is necessarily uh, verbal okay so language is more of a, uh, a kind of a system for conveying concepts uh, through the use of let's say codes and symbols and in order for each side like now when i'm talking to you in a language for you and me to understand what we're talking we must know that code okay and speech 
what it involves is the vocalizing you know it's the vocalizing of uh, specific sounds and these sounds are called phonemes so a language has a set of these phonemes and rules for using them so both these both language and speech are really really important for communication and uh, you know studies have shown that the way we as parents communicate with our children it they it predicts how proficient the child becomes as a communicator very important it also impacts how well they do at school so it's something that you know we should really uh, think about and remember and to tell us about these concepts about uh, speech in particular we have a amazing expert with us today punam desai so she is a speech um, and language pathologist she's got more than 15 years of experience in uh, pediatric speech and language therapy and she has a bachelor's degree in audiology and speech language pathology so she will share some you know really wonderful uh, insights that she has gained in the course of her career she's been interacting with thousands of children so it's going to be a very interesting session i promise you welcome poonam it's great to have you with us hi yeah hi vidyut thank you for the warm welcome uh, yeah. it's really nice to be here on babla talking to a lot of parents who i you know have come with a lot of uh, things on their mind yeah yeah great so we always have our parents have a lot of questions so what we uh, do is we uh, we will have a full 30 minutes uh, um, you know question and answer session with our parents uh, but i i would urge your parents like if you all have questions you feel free to type it in the chat window and you know we'll take it up in the order in which it comes you know it works well that way so that everybody gets a chance and you know uh, to interact with our expert so um, so before let's begin but uh, there's just a few things i want to tell you before we begin uh, first of all we have a very interesting announcement at the end of the session so uh, wait for it and secondly uh, you know we have started uh, when you all end the session either when i end it uh, or when you all leave this session you will see uh, a link given to you it's a feedback form so we just uh, would request you to fill up that uh, feedback form it's a very short one i promise you it's a very short form for a uh, short one i mean normally feedback forms are big and people tend to not fill them but this is a very small one i i urge you all to fill it up so you know it will help us uh, bring you a better session or you know we'll incorporate your views in there and also i would like to uh, read a disclaimer as always um, so uh, let me just read this um this session is not intended to give any personal medically medical advice we are only going to mention broad and generally accepted principles and practices please consult your doctor or specialist about all specific questions and circumstances okay uh so let's begin so punam first of all um, you know uh, can you tell us about uh, baby babbling now, what exactly it is and why is it so important Okay, so baby babbling is a stage that comes between cooing and the child actually making words. Um, I wouldn't say it's the only stage; there are other stages too. But this is like an important one because this is the first time that the child starts making sounds. Okay, right. and uh, they can be um, sounds as uh, papa, papa, which are like you know simple babbling that the children do at the beginning. Hmm. And once the children are babbling like that, we try to associate those sounds. to what we think the child is saying so that kind of forms the first interaction between the parents and the child mm. after that uh, ch- uh, children will use varied sounds in babbling it becomes variegated babbling that means they'll use combination of sounds it would be it can be baba baba long strings okay. they can uh, add two two three sounds together and make a sound but these are not words these are simply them trying to experiment with their vocal hmm. system like they're trying they have suddenly realized okay there is something that comes out of my mouth when i do these things together so right. for the fun of it they make a lot of sounds right so that's what babbling is yeah. so babbling becomes important because it means that most systems of your child are fine mm-hmm. you know he's hearing well he's responding well and it is the first sign that he is actually the language is actually falling on his ears he's right. understanding that sound can be used to mm-hmm. uh, you know Uh, explore uh, the world around right 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 
So that's interesting. So it's uh, basically the child is also experimenting. He can just hear his vocalizing his uh, chords, I would say, and he can hear what he's um, yeah. saying as well. So uh, interestingly, Poonam, uh, uh, Babler comes from, you know, we had that idea. So babbling to Babler, <laughs> let's hope. So, okay, that's uh, another thing is, uh, so what happens is uh, while, while we do know that, you know, there are speech milestones and they involve probably uh, a series of stages, maybe crying to cooing, forming a few words and it cult culminates into sentences. Uh, of course, uh, we know that it's different for each baby, but uh, generically, can you like kind of tell us, uh, you know, the stages of first, first speech and later language development? So as I said before, you know, it starts off with cooing. So the child coos when they're happy and cries when they are, you know, uncomfortable or in discomfort or hungry. So the mother is able to distinguish between the two, depending on, you know, how the child is feeling and how the child is trying to get the mother's attention. Hmm. After that comes your babbling. Uh, then there is variegated babbling, as I mentioned. Hmm. After that follows uh, jargon. So basically by then uh, the children are actually listening to what, adults around are saying so when you see a child who's uh, on jargon speech the child will actually make sent uh, make a sentence like structure so there'll be several sounds put together and you will find an intonation pattern of an adult in there yeah. so maybe it'll sound like a question or it'll sound like a surprise uh, you know a surprise statement but there are no true words it's just a jumble of sounds that they use and they try to replicate bring it closer to what the adult's intonation pattern is right and right. after that comes your first word. So this uh, babbling is around, uh, you know, starts off at four months to six mm. months. Jargon speech comes around uh, between uh, 10 months and on. And by, you know, say one and a half, one and a half years, they would have come up with their first word or a few words, depending on how the child has progressed. Uh -huh. so around 12 months. So when the child is about one year plus, they would have said their first word. I suppose. So yeah, the textbook, uh -huh. uh, a milestone if you ask me that's how it is but it is yeah. different for every child every child will do it at a different time at their own pace absolutely yeah. absolutely and that's very important to remember actually because you uh, that's uh, it's a good thing for parents to not are iska bacha or bol raha mera nahi bol raha that's okay i suppose it should, we shouldn't be kind of doing that so mm -hmm. So actually in the, uh, you know, you did give us a nice uh, ev evolution of the uh, milestone, uh, you know, uh, based on the, on the months of progress. But in the, let's say in the early infancy stages, when, when babies are so small, they are, I guess they're just literally copying us. So what uh, Poonam would be the right way to, you know, sort of interact with your little one? Definitely, I'm sure, you know, what what your baby hears and what your what they are exposed to definitely matters i'm sure so if you could tell us about that it definitely matters um, so if you see a small baby you know who's uh, lying on its back hmm. uh, and can look at any individual which is in front of them right before their eyes hmm. so usually the mother so if the baby is cooing or crying depending on what he or she needs the mother will actually talk to the baby oh are you hungry are you wet yeah Shall I clean you? Do you want me to give you something? What does my baby want to do? So the mother will talk like this to the baby. It's not actually the baby's thoughts. Oh. The mother is trying to place uh, the need of the child as to what the child is requiring. Now, this is a very important thing that parents can uh, do. You know, It's called parallel talk. Okay. It's basically if your child um, is not able to communicate to you exactly what they want. You know, there are There are times when children simply cry because they don't know when and how to communicate whether they're hungry whether they're hurt ah. so at that time this kind of parallel talk helps where the parent starts talking saying that you know oh, what is it that you need are you hurt mama i'm hungry can i get some food uh -huh. basically it's a model that you're providing the child okay this is what you can say instead of this I instead see. of crying you can actually say this so it begins as a baby the baby is not really saying it for you but mm. as the baby grows, becomes a toddler, if the parents have been using parallel right. speech with them, then you will see that the baby will come up with language structures which are complete. Mm. The toddler, let me correct myself. The toddler will come up with language structures which are complete. Right. Um, when children are really small babies, we tend to do baby talk with them. Mm. So, you know, we'll talk like, you know, what is my baby doing? 
Hmm. So it's not clear speech. Correct. That is okay as long as your baby was small. The moment your baby has crossed, say, eight months, nine months, maybe a year, if to be liberal, it's good if you can start talking to the baby in clear language, hmm. the way you would speak. Right. Of course, you don't expect the baby to understand PhD level talk, but it okay. needs to be language which is clear and you are using correct grammar when you're speaking to them. Yeah. So automatically the baby copies correct grammatical structures. Correct. I think even uh, using a, a vocabulary is very important. Like the more vocabulary you give for, you know, maybe uh, first time you've used one particular word, maybe you can use a synonym for the next, for that word, the next time you talk or something like that. We, in fact, in Babler, we ask our uh, parents to have a conversation and, you know, a conversation which is actually filled with uh, vocabulary so that all these words keep falling on the child's ears. So, so that's interesting what you said, parallel talk, you called it, right? Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. So also, I think uh, it's in the early infancy stages, they are in that mirroring. If you, if you're looking at them and you're talking, I, I think if you kind of, uh, even in your lips, when you say, Ooh, or something, the child will also give you that reaction. So yes. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, a, a four or a five month old will clap if you clap. Yeah, correct. There are yeah. the stage where they will imitate that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So while I said this uh, before also, I think we should not compare our children with each other, but parents normally, um, you know, tend to have this or they expect something like that. So yeah. it can, it can overwhelm the little one. So any thoughts about it uh, more specifically in terms of talking or speech? So generally every child, you know, follows their own pace of doing things. Right. So maybe there is a child who has said his first word when he was 10 months old. Mm -hmm. There may be another child who will say the, you know, say the first few words when they're actually approaching two. Right. The parents have to remember that the only time to get worried is when there's no progress. Mm -hmm. okay? Or the progress is really slow. Okay. If your child is curious enough, comes to you, asks questions, child is learning, you know, at least uh, a few new words every single week. Mm. Then your child is taking Fine. his course he's doing yeah. he or she is doing you know what is required for him to learn to speak right so we need to have patience um secondly you know i think uh, the way i have seen things around me evolve like i started work in 2004 mm. and you know till now the way uh, classes and uh, you know apps and everything for children has come in it's it's like it's a whole uh, wide world out there Mm -hmm. uh, and there is so much that you know parents want their kids to know they want them to become the best at everything yeah but sometimes it is you know at, at the age where you know the two and the three it's uh, it'll it is really nice to see what the child is leading at correct, correct. you know where, yeah. where the child is drifting right so if the child is drifting into a certain interest area it's a good time good way to you know start off there and then maybe you know guide the child to some other place hmm. correct so uh, even if uh, there are a lot of, as you said, so many things in this whole wild world, world in front of the child, and it's actually up to the discretion of the parents what they select for their children. Right. So um, yeah, that's true. So um, so there's another thing that I have been wondering. Many uh, parents of toddlers have uh, they have actually noted this that their babies have begun to start talking early uh, later. You know, in fact, in my building itself, there are two little babies and uh, th those mothers interact with me and they ask me, so when did your child start talking? And then I, I remember it was maybe around uh, one plus years, like you said, you know, mm. so I'm just wondering what could be the reasons for this, like uh, children are talking later and later um, over the period of time. Okay. If you ask me about the pandemic, mm. then I think a lot of things, a lot of uh, you know, lack, a lot of social exposure has been reduced for these children. Right. Like when children are small, right, you know, they, they start walking, you start taking them out to the park, you're taking them on play dates. Yeah. They're interacting with other children, they're interacting with other adults. Right. So there, are, there is a variety of speech that they get exposed to. Right. Somehow during the pandemic, uh, it has reduced. There are no other adults than parents. Probably right. if it's a nuclear family, just parents and the child. And if both parents are working, then there is some amount of screen time that the child has to be on. Right. 
Right. Especially when the lockdown was there, there were no maids. Uh, parents were having a harrowing time. You know, they didn't right. know how to take care of all this. So I think everybody's worked out their solutions. But yeah, a lot of not being able to fall into that social circle which was required for them at that age mm. does you know uh, bring uh, slow down their uh, speech. Correct. Another thing is that. Uh, if if the child has had issues uh, with the health like mm. if you have your child is having cold cough often complains mm. of a earache or has you know ear drum leaking ears there is discharge from the ears in that case uh, the hearing of the child will always be affected at those times of their life right so they are they are not hearing it clearly they are hearing half the sounds they are not hearing mm. all the sounds so mm-hmm. at that time also you'll see that you know children are if they're not hearing well they are automatically not speaking correct fully. correct correct yeah. yeah so that's also important that you uh, sometimes you will see children like they would they have their ear rubbing uh, hand rubbing on their ears very often so that could be a sign of a ear infection and uh, i guess it should be attended to uh, right. immediately but you did mention no it's not only uh, the pandemic of course has uh, um, contributed a lot towards this uh, lack of social interaction but even i guess even at home nowadays parents are not communicating as much with their little babies i think they they should be encouraged to do that right i mean talk with your babies a lot that's very important don't you think yeah i guess i mean if uh, i said the pandemic because you know that was a time where really that uh, cut yeah. down of uh, so, you know interaction was there correct of course correct. when parents are working usually there is the maid and the maid interacts with the child that goes on but a uh, kind of focused interaction or focused communication mm-hmm. with the child is not happening you know you're not really uh, you've not really sat with the child or worked one you know, one on one on something that the child is doing absolutely you know, and it's basically if the child is playing on something and you know you interact with the child that play grows correct like it's like a little story or a little thing that they're doing which they keep talking more and more correct the correct. more you uh, there is a response the more they want to talk right right and it kind of brings out a lot of communication in them yeah so i guess that's a good point that you made like i mean even in the play when you're talking you, you can uh, have this conversation with your child talk about everything that you're playing so you know that way uh, the child will pick up a lot of vocabulary and it's it's and good speech basically it's important that you um, yeah it's especially important uh, around the age of 2 to 1 and a half then they are practically repeating everything that falls on their ears right right i'm sure parents there are times when parents have embarrassing you know <laughs> times of what the child may repeat and where yeah but that that is a time they're like sponges they're absorbing everything that falls on their ears absolutely so how you say it to them and where mm. you say it to them matters how much you say also matters correct correct yeah so um, like we did uh, you told us about the uh, milestones of uh, talking but mm-hmm. let's talk about the clarity of speech you know uh, many parents are worried uh, or rather uh, they tend to ask about this so, so when does a child speak clearly let's say in general meaning okay so huh. if you see speech development from when the child is a baby to you know say uh, by 4 4 and a half years generally mm-hmm. all the structures of language have come by 4 and a half years they are they have all the language skills that any adult would have right only thing it's all unrefined and raw so mm-hmm. gradually as you attend school and go on you know that it, the language improves Right. now uh, the thing uh, for speech it's uh, for the speech sounds it's slightly different children will start picking up uh, what we call labial sounds basically sounds which are made by the lips first okay so that's why the babbling is papa baba it because it's uh. a very visible thing gradually the sounds will develop so uh, then then come your to do no and then after that towards the fagin so say by 6 years they would have achieved all these basic sounds right right between 6 right. to 8 years they'll achieve the difficult sounds the chs and the zs mm-hmm. and the so so show also come by 6 the okay. r sometimes takes a while for a lot of kids mm-hmm. you know have a child speaking l instead of a r for a long time yeah up to 6 6 and a half is fine sometimes they corrected by 6 correct yeah this will you'll see a 5 year old you know talking with no r there yeah, yeah. <laughs> correct yeah. right 
and uh, i think uh, uh, there is also you know some kids uh, they uh, i don't know the english word for it but the, they talk aise totle bolte hai like ya fir bobde as in marathi we say you know uh-huh. like uh, little cute talk it sounds very cute but is that something that you should be concerned about or you know because if that is appreciated like it sounds cute to you but uh, it might end up as being a defect right so should we uh, look at that i mean Uh, these kind of things so or there are two ways to look at it <coughs> excuse me so there are two ways to look at it so uh, when children are developing speech hmm. between the age of 2 to 4 you will see all these errors you know where they are not saying the ro they are not saying the ro they are not hmm. saying sh correctly they are not saying s correctly they are substituting some sounds for the others right but by the time they reach the age of 4 no all these errors will get corrected ha ah. most of their speech is clear except right. maybe the ro and the ch you know the difficult sounds most of the speech is clear right right but if the error still persists mm-hmm. then there is a worry and if the error still persists there you have to look at what type of an error it is right. so then there is articulatory errors basically your teeth your lips your tongue these are all articulators they okay. ch- they give uh, how do i say they shape the sound that comes out of your throat ah. from different sounds So at a throat level, you're just saying an ah. Ah. Uh-huh. Just because your lips and your tongue and everything moves, it turns into different sounds. Okay. So there are kids who are not able, have not learned the right manner of saying it. Hmm. So they're not placing the tongue right. They're not holding the lips right, or maybe the the jaw is too tight or it is too loose. Okay. And they are not. The placement is not right, so the sound is not coming out correct. Hmm. If you meet a kid, you know who doesn't have the front two teeth. Front two teeth have gone yeah. missing. you'll see a lot of air escaping when they talk yeah yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. so uh, these are errors because of not learning the right way of articulating it mm-hmm. can be corrected mm-hmm. you teach them the right way the sound gets corrected mm-hmm. yeah other than that is phonological errors okay where uh, it's not just the placement of the articulators they have actually they are actually perceiving that sound wrong as well okay when they are saying a y for a l or they saying doggy or goggy instead of doggy okay. they are not really um, aware of that that they're making that mistake hmm. they have not perceived that sound right like there is i hear that sound and then there is that understanding of that sound right. so their understanding that how that sound is being produced is missing so okay. these are phonological errors now phonological errors are basically they'll make errors with units So if you ask them to say a d or a g, they know it. Okay. But when they have to say it in context of a word, where there are several sounds put together, yeah. they mix it up. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Agree. So you will have errors where they are uh, substituting one sound for another. So like you know, common one is like you know, instead of sun, they'll say tan. Ah. Uh-huh. There's a t for a s. Right. Right. Another one is what I just told you, assimilation. This basically one sound in the word is overshadowing the other sound. So dot d. Uh-huh. Dog gets overshadowed by the dog. Okay. And uh, you know, then they they will even omit hmm. some sounds. Like if they have to say book, they'll only say boo. Hmm. So okay. These errors generally occur when they're learning language, but by four four and a half they should be gone. Yeah. Yeah. If they're not, then they have to see a speech therapist, and they have to be corrected. Hmm. Because these are errors of learning the. unit of speech which they have not learned on their own which they will not correct on their own yeah yeah, yeah. so so that's interesting so but um, uh, you know uh, like uh, when you gave these examples i think it's uh, the responsibility like we as parents or people who are around these little ones i think uh, every time we hear that sound it will be useful to you know sort of uh, like you said tan you know or you can help the child by uh, like look at my lips when i'm saying say sir something like that i'm i'm sure we can motivate the child to uh, yeah so the thing is that if it's an articulation error that he- works okay yeah like if it's an articulation error if the uh-huh. child starts learning placing it right but if it's a phonological error and he really doesn't uh-huh. has understood the concept of how the sir is being so he right. can say sir when you ask him to say sir okay but you ask him to say son he'll say tan right 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 you know you yeah. you you will actually get flustered yeah. by how many times the child would do that error mm. because he really doesn't know how to place that sound in that word right, right. in that case the mm. child has to be first made aware of the error then he has to be shown how it is corrected 
Hmm. And then after that, we have to show him how to apply it to words, then phrases, then sentences, and then in running speech. Running speech okay. being the most difficult part of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's that's interesting. So I think we touched about this a little bit, but I just want to ask you this more specifically. Like you know, you said uh, hearing and speech is connected. So uh, and we have to be, I suppose, watchful of uh, when the baby's hearing is uh, having a problem or not. So could you tell us what should a parent uh, keep an eye out for? So uh, basically, you know, children uh, tend to have ear infections very often. Yeah. Because one reason is, you know, they catch cold very often. They're touching everywhere. They're putting the same hand in their mouth. Correct. Um, they tend, if there is a you know, viral season going on, they will catch cold much faster. Hmm. So uh, in that case, if a child has a tendency where the, mid, the ear gets affected, hmm. then you will have, uh, you know, discharge coming out of the ear. Right. Sometimes it is plain. Sometimes it is, you know, uh, past purulent. Uh, in that case, the child's ear is filled with fluid, right? So okay. when the sound is coming in, mm -hmm. it gets filtered. Some of the sounds are lost in that area where the fluid oh, is. Okay. And only partially the other sounds have moved ahead. Mm. So the child is hearing half things. Right. So right. that that's the reason that you know we have to take care of ear infections. Correct. Uh, so another, I... Yeah, another thing that I think I should mention is stammering. Mm. You know, mm. uh, children... Uh, have normal non-fluency. Non-fluency means, uh, you know, getting stuck, repeating one word several times or maybe right. getting stuck on a sound, repeating it. Mm -hmm. That is something uh, that occurs when they're learning to speak because, you know, their mouth is uh, going faster and brain is playing catch-up. Correct. Gotcha. Or other way around, sometimes the brain is moving faster and the mouth is playing yeah. catch-up. Mm -hmm. So they get stuck and you'll see a lot of uh, uh, uh coming. Okay. But by four, four and a half, both of them are moving at the same pace. So you will right. see the common non-fluency disappears. Okay. But if it persists beyond that, then we have to worry. Then okay. we again, you know, find right. Yeah. That's a, that's a good thumb rule, I guess. So we'll just continue to quickly, just uh, one uh, one question more, I guess, one or two questions, just a, a quick one. So, um, so, you know, any, like as I said before also, I mean, some something that you can give us some tips as to how we can encourage our little ones to, uh, gently make them talk or communicate, you know, some games, activities that we can uh, do with them. Any suggestions on that? I think one of my favorite activities is, you know, joint attention. Now, okay. um, joint attention is something you can do at every age level. Okay. Uh, you know, at least till they turn into teens and they don't want to do it with you. But uh, as a baby, uh, you can have a baby who's sitting and you start, you know, with a nice colorful object and the baby will look at the object and look at you that is joint attention where you both are looking mm. at the same object you are talking right. about the same object right. so even a baby does it you take a toddler you start taking a toy car or a train or a ball or a doll whatever is their favorite toy right. you start moving it talking about it and they will also share that interest and they you they will look at you they will talk they look at the toy again they'll say something about it right that's joint attention. You're jointly attending to an object and that is a very big milestone for being able to establish communication. Hmm, hmm. I right. cannot communicate with you if you're not attending with me. You have to be on the same topic as I am. Yeah. So joint attention is like the you know precursor to that. Right. Um, so there are several activities you can do in that. One which I said, you know, looking at a very nice object, like little kids were just sitting, they like that noisy objects, bright objects, hmm. something that turns you can, they will ask you to do it repeatedly. Right. And that way you can help them learn to establish that uh, mm -hmm. communication with you. Um, with toddlers, you know, who are talking, you can have a, a make-believe place. Right. You're doing, a, you're building a house or you're having a village or there is a farm and, you know, there are animals there. So there they can have a lot of vocabulary that they pick up. You can talk about so many things on yeah. what the child is saying. Correct. But parents have to remember it cannot be one way. You can't be dishing out knowledge. It's not dishing knowledge. It's about seeing what the child is interested in knowing and supplying the information. Absolutely. Because when that is done, then the child is interested in retaining it. Otherwise, correct. they tend to phase out after a point and they will walk away. Correct. You know, correct. This is Absolutely. getting too much. Yeah. That, that's how it will be with children. Yeah. Um, another good thing is rhymes. You can do a lot of imitation. Imitation is very good. Imitation of body actions. Imitation of 
movements of the mouth imitation of words and sentences everything gets incorporated into rhymes absolutely. they are also a good way of you know helping children uh, pick up language yeah uh, improve or correct on whatever that they feel is you know getting mm-hmm. stuck or falling mm-hmm. short in their language so they will they love rhymes so that is another good absolutely great so it's very nice uh, poonam that you told on this because you know exactly this what you called it as uh, joint attention we've been telling our uh, who are babler parents they already might be knowing you know we talk about this uh, uh, you know five things in fact in our sessions also we share with them like it's like uh, we say focus focus is that joint attention huh. then encourage your child to talk about it then you name it what is that thing that you're talking about right. then you you take turns you know each one take turns that's the yeah. third one and importantly you practice the beginnings and the ends so mm. this is uh, something very interesting if uh, they parents keep to stick to that it will be very yeah. uh, useful and um, i think in our uh, last uh, we had one uh, session uh, some time before it was on language development early language development so our expert there surekha had shared some activities i'll share it with uh, the parents at the end of the session as well um so i guess uh, it's time now for our question and answer sessions i think punam you have been you have uh, told us a lot of information uh, so let's talk uh, to our parents and see what questions they have so um, so just as i said right from the beginning let me just pick up a few questions from the uh, chat uh, the common one has been how many languages can the child speak yeah so uh, yeah i mean can you speak hindi hindi will become more comfortable oh, acha this is they're telling us to speak hindi is it yeah uh, okay um yeah we'll in we can talk in hindi also but uh, like i think it's more comfortable right now in uh, english that's how our sessions are we'll we'll consider talking in hindi as well so how many languages can we introduce to our child so i have like probably every parent who has come to me ask me this you know like uh, given that a lot of us now are uh, married to each other coming from different communities different language backgrounds correct so you know you have a gujarat like you take my example for example i am a maharashtrian my husband is a gujarati mm. um the, then i have another couple who come uh, who i meet they are one is north indian one is south indian so right so the question always is that can i introduce both the languages to the child correct um children can pick up both the languages there's no harm as long as you are using the correct grammatical grammatical structures of both the languages hmm. now uh, most of the times i encourage the parents to do it so that if if i see you know that the child is struggling with using the two languages i encourage them that one parent follows their language the other one follows their language that hmm. is one way when mm-hmm. you know two parents speak their own languages with the child another way is if both the parents are well versed with the with the with both the languages mm-hmm. that are being introduced to the child then i suggest that they say the sentence in their mother tongue mm-hmm. and you know then there is the question of having english because the child has to go to school and speak english so i ask them to then repeat the same sentence in the other language that they want the child to speak right right so suppose if i am saying ke mujhe bahar jana hai i want to go out Hmm. So the child then correct. learns to relate that the both sentences mean the same. Correct, correct. And there is no hard and fast rule that it has to be one language. The 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 rule actually is that it has to be a language which is grammatically correct. Hmm. The child needs to have a strong grammatic base. Basically, the language structures have to be strong at least in one language because then in other language the child will automatically apply. Hmm, hmm. it is messed up in both the languages the child is half way both ways so then then you will see a lot of mix up correct so so i guess uh, uh, you know whichever language you, there's no problem in teaching any language or speaking any language but you're saying that the purity of the language should be men, uh, maintained yeah. huh? but again i would discourage parents to get over ambitious and try spanish german and everything <laughs> yeah yeah okay. stick to your mother tongues the first thing anyways when the child goes to school hindi and english is going to come in hmm. and in school as it is you know there are three languages so yeah. that that will automatically add into the list right. one mother you know having a mother tongue and then the other languages hmm. is easy right. for the child also to communicate at home right in babler also we provide uh, with nine indian languages but our condition is this that whoever is uh, doing this with the child must be speaking the language 
I mean, it's not a digital voice that's going to fall on your ears or anything like that. You have to be speaking the language. You have to be talking to the child. Only then that can happen. So uh, how to, uh, Ripika is asking about how to teach multiple language to kids and how to ensure that kids have more clarity in their speech. I think you did touch upon this yeah. quite a lot. So um, yeah, recording of this will eventually be put on our YouTube channel. Uh, when we have that recording, we'll put it up and our customer support will let you know. Uh, for now, we will, yeah, if you have any queries, uh, Pooja, you ask us, we will Hindi, we will give you an answer, there is no problem, but in our session is, uh, session is uh, in English, we will consider this as well. Uh, so, Rushka says, is it normal for two months old to say, mumma, mum, help, say help, mumma, mum? Uh, I haven't come across a two month old. Ah, that, that. Yeah, that's very early, I guess. Oh, it's just me. Yeah. It probably is just a random thing that has come out maybe. Yeah, I, I suppose so. And Ruchi says, my baby is 11 months old. She started saying mumma, papa, dada from nine months, but she still didn't say mamma or mumma and papa to papa. Okay, she okay. said it to you, but not to, <laughs> to your husband, I suppose, right? Is that what you're saying? I suppose she's saying that. So... She so, didn't say mama to mama and papa to papa. Okay, uh, probably queries where, you know, they're related to uh, delayed language or uh, issues okay. with how uh, the child is holding language. I would really like to hear more from the parents mm -hmm. because this query, the way it has come, I don't really know what it is that the child is, what yeah. stage of speech the child is at okay. or you know, how the child is develop so without knowing that answering this query wouldn't be a fair answer right okay okay so puja says how to teach a 22 month old baby uh, teach what you mean the language so i think uh, that if you're saying it's the language i guess uh, we've been sharing these tips uh, punam has been talking about uh, you know uh, how to talk to your child in different languages, I think reading is. Uh, Poonam, you want to add anything to specifically if she uh, is expecting something from you? By 22 months, a uh, child should have a lot of vocabulary. Uh, will be probably making, uh, you know, good, good phrases and is probably yeah. making sentences. Um, at such a time, introducing stories, rhymes is a good thing because they learn to uh, they learn to string the words together. So, uh, stories provides a good, uh, you know, uh, structured language. Correct. When we speak, we're not always structured in our responses. You know, responses are sometimes half, sometimes full. Stories will always have structured language. So, uh, uh, telling them simple stories using simple picture books, that's a great idea. Hmm. Uh, getting them to, you know, get in, uh, involved in rhymes with you where they repeat rhymes with you, that will help. Correct. Um, other than that, showing pictures labeling pictures, labeling uh, action pictures right. to build up on the language. So I was just wondering, Pooja, are you a Babler parent? Because many of our Babler parents wouldn't have a question like this, I, I hope, because, uh, you know, like we have, we are suggesting like you can have, you can do conversations with your child. Every day you do a conversation, read a lot of books, read books in different languages. You know, there are so many kinds of things and... Uh, take your baby out, have socialize, have a lot of uh, uh, play dates as Poonam mm. said. So how many languages, uh, this is uh, somebody is asking, how many languages can they learn and understand when they are young? So, yeah. So from uh, what literature I've read, I assume, I, I can tell you that two or three languages definitely. I mean, uh, my children have grown up between four languages, that is English, Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi. Yeah. And the uh, elder one speaks, was speaking all four by the time he was four. Correct. So uh, generally, the number of languages that children hear, they will pick up on them when they're in a stage where they're picking up words. Um, my sister is in Amsterdam. My nephew is speaking Dutch and Hindi. Mm -hmm. So uh, it depends on what environment the child is, what languages they're hearing. They will pick those languages. Absolutely. So you will notice that they will always stick to their mother tongue when it comes to communicating, but you will notice that if they have started hearing new language, you will start seeing words in their conversation. Hmm. It will start off as words and then gradually phrases will come in. 
absolutely yeah. i think i have also read uh, it's it's basically by the age of 3 uh, kids don't have a capacity of learning more than about six languages yeah. they can pick up so because at in 0 to 3 i think it's huge that language peak is huge in the brain so but the condition as you said you know it has to be a native speaker and um, that interaction has to happen that's very important so it's not like somebody you buy a, a language device and put it in front of the child that i don't know how much it will work but uh, it's important that the uh, interaction with the mother or with the caregiver and the child is there so krutika is asking if two years if two years little uh, old didn't speak as like the peers but doing all the activities well pretend play simple dance babbling etc would that hold them behind till the last so they are not speaking at the age of 2 but doing all the other activities i would still like to know more about this child i will not be able to comment on it just based on this much yeah so yeah maybe we can share your number yeah probably these parents can forward their queries to you yeah. to you or to me and you know i can yeah, i sure. can have more elaborate discussion on this because it's not something you can really answer on a forum correct correct with this shorter time yeah so generic uh, things we are discussing yeah, here yeah yeah okay. so rushka says he does that a lot and when i sing rhymes to him he tries to complete the sentence by the uh, by the rhyme at times sorry will be turning 3 now okay will be turning 3 i i missed the earlier i should i go back to your rushka said something earlier okay for a two month to say ha huh? so she it didn't it was not two month it was three yeah oh, but still even three but months I, three mama months. help is a fair enough statement yeah okay so i i suppose yeah okay So now Anustha is saying my daughter is twenty two months only speaks words and most of the time says ah uh, in a question tone. Okay. Again, I would like yeah. to know more about this child. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just to clarify to all the parents who are writing the queries, uh, when you come up with a question, these are questions which are very uh, particular to your child. So unless I know about the child more, it's not right on my part to comment on this. So I would really encourage you all to post the queries separately. Uh, any generic questions, I am open to answering. Yeah. 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 So Ripika says, is it okay for a two point seven year old uh, child to say very few unclear words, around thirty words, and not able to tell when he is pooping in his diaper? Uh, how can I help him uh, to communicate at least non-verbally when he wants to poop? Okay. Um, this is a topic again, a separate topic altogether yeah. in itself. But yeah, uh, two point seven. Uh, this is a time when they are in between uh, getting off the diapers, frankly. Mm. Uh, so forming a steady toilet habit for the child would form would be a great idea. You know, getting rid of yeah. the diapers gradually and getting the child to actually go to the toilet and do. Uh, because once you associate uh, the task to the place. the child will have some reason to tell you that he needs to go there correct diaper doesn't need any access it is just there yeah the absolutely. child is not going to fall into communicating over it yeah um unclear at 2.7 yes most 2.7 year olds are unclear mm -hmm. uh, again by unclear around 30 words what sounds is he un is he or she unclear on is very important mm -hmm. if you're telling me they're not saying r clearly or sh sure clearly i wouldn't worry But if you're telling me they are not saying ter clearly, per clearly, then I'll be worried. Mm -hmm. So you know, that again is a very vague question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we had this uh, session earlier, forming the forming right habits. You know, it's very important, like you said, to develop a routine, a discipline, a habit. Also, it's uh, essential. So if we as parents have a routine, I'm sure our uh, children also pick up that. Um, so. Uh, Okay, incidentally, I have a question uh, because her question, uh, Ripika's question, popped something in my mind as well. So when they are not communicating verbally, he wants to poop or something. I know there are kids, especially American moms, they teach their uh, children sign language. You know, uh, how good is that? Is it a good idea to do that with your? Uh, If your child really has a difficulty in communicating, and you know, words don't come that quick. Mm. before that uh, active act or task that the child is supposed to do is done mm -hmm. 
introducing signs makes sense if the child uh, gets comfortable with it like once it is non verbal communication you really have to figure out what is comfortable with the child sometimes the pictures help like you know there's a picture of potty stuck on the toilet door uh, and there is a picture of a toilet around the house or with the child and then the child can either give it or point to it if uh, he, she wants to go okay then you know that that is picture communication sign language is another way as you said but you know again mm-hmm. with signs i don't know when how much a baby below 3 years will be able to do it really needs dexterity okay Okay. But yeah, I do have three-year-olds who will, you know, put up their fingers. Uh-huh. So, and, there, and there are kids who do that. But it again entirely depends on how comfortable the child is in doing that. Correct. Or sometimes giving them a word to say which they will understand. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, they may not be, they may not be able to say toilet or washroom. Hmm. Mm-hmm. But you know, if I want to do pee pee or poo poo is also something mm. that is easy Correct. for them because those are easy words to say. Right. Right. Yeah. So Tusha says, how can I start storytelling to a twenty-month-old baby? I think we have dev- uh, delved on this for a uh, topic for many times in our sessions. So um, we had a storytelling session, and it's there on our channel already. So maybe you can have a look at that. Uh, we'll send you a link of it. Uh, Kushbu says, I don't make my baby watch TV and YouTube. People say my baby would not learn many things because of that. What all shall I do to bridge the gap? I don't want to make her watch video. She is nine months old. Okay, nine months old doesn't. I mean, let me start off like that. Okay, when we were around as children, if you imagine your own childhood, I don't think there were YouTubes or uh, you know uh, major uh, TV channels or video systems that were videos that were available. Frankly, mm. but still, it didn't hamper our learning. the process of learning doesn't just need the screen media it can be anything it can be your environment uh, the objects at your home or uh, the toys that you have the things lying outside the things outside your window children can learn out of anything um, it is not necessary to expose a child as small as 9 months to videos to learn you have pictures you have books you have apps where you can use pictures but uh, i'm not saying that it's uh, the child is going to lose out of on something just because you didn't show youtube videos hmm correct yeah. so it's uh, i would look at it like this it's basically uh, uh, the amount of content that's available uh, is huge on the uh, from on the digital side and the competition is also huge but uh, you know if if you if a a caregiver is capable enough of providing that information at the chi- at the rate at which the child is asking i think that's great uh, but you know you might want to consider that screen it's it's not just leaving a child with a screen that uh, you, you should never do that so anything that any app that claims that give the um, give the screen to your child and let the child learn doesn't happen we are against such kind of things but when there is an interaction in the screen is just being used as a tool i think that should not be a problem but again it's the parents discretion i would say yeah so um and since we are on the topic of screens and you know, i just popped in my mind let me say it as well uh, a lot of us have been gotten into habit of putting a screen in front of a child when they eating ah uh, i would really really encourage parents to not absolutely. do that Absolutely. your child may eat one roti less or eat not eat rice one day is okay but uh, setting that habit that food is going to be on the table you have to come to the table and eat Correct. and at the time the family is on the table talking to each other or you know just the mother and the child or just the maid and the child whoever it is mm. the child doesn't actually need the screen absolutely um, a few reasons for that one reason um, children don't understand how much they eat when they're watching something mm so uh, you know like when i'm eating i know when i get full uh, you will realize that the child who's actually watching the screen and eating the child will gag only when the that's when the caregiver uh-huh. stops feeding them you know uh-huh. that's when they like really fill fill themselves up yeah. but when the child and the best thing to do is let the child eat with their own hands yeah the texture of the food in their hands teaches them what they're eating they learn to eat it then taste it so they are able to associate the texture that they touch to the taste that it is given correct they also have the opportunity of asking you know okay what is this what did i eat yeah, this is really correct. bitter or this is really sour what are these tastes you know or i don't like this i like this you actually start having an interaction with the child over there absolutely 
So screens during food time is a big no no. I hope parents can take that message home. I yeah. am a big proponent of that. Do not mm-hmm. put screens in front of children when they Absolutely. eat. Absolutely. Which I also agree. means that some parents will have to sacrifice on their <laughs> yeah. eating. Yeah, correct. Yeah. No, no. I think I agree with you completely. <laughs> that screen time at food time is imp- is is an absolute no. And you know that's a, a meal times are an amazing bonding time with your family. You know, all of you can share experiences, talk, even the little. one when they immersed in these exper- uh, experiences i i'm sure eventually the child will also share okay i did this at my day care i did this in my school it's very essential to do that actually meal times is a very great time for story times and rhyme times you know with them absolutely and you you see children build demand can you tell a story uh-huh. or you know is there a crow on the window then we'll sit there and eat they okay. have that thing you know let's count the crows or is the crow coming can i feed him something They, they kind of form a connect with the environment outside correct, correct. once you are on the screen you're there you're not seeing mm-hmm. what's happening around you you're completely unaware i mean Absolutely. we as parents can even look at ourselves on screens you know mm-hmm. you're not hear what your child was talking right beside you yeah it's that absorbing and for yeah. children who are already like sponges you know they're like simply mm-hmm. grasping on everything that becomes too engaging a medium and then they are like oblivious to everything around correct So screen should be used with discretion there's no doubt about it and a definite no at uh, feeding time so shubham is asking about how to teach math to a one year old baby i think this is a bit off topic but for babbler parents they would know in babbler we have this whole concept of math and logic so you know math is there all around you so even the flowers or the petals that you see in a fl- in a flower there are some which they follow a sequence you know so have the child explore that you can talk about uh, look let's count the petals or something like that so initially uh, i think this this topic is a big one uh, maybe we might uh, take it up uh, on a one to one or a little later or we can send you a message separately shubham so um, yeah again you know i mean uh, to this question i would like to reiterate my statement Sure. please let your child lead at this age as to whether what they should your child will start showing interest even when they start uh, on in numbers even when they start pressing the lift buttons absolutely not asking you the numbers so let, let, letting the child lead will tell you what the child wants at that time so mm. it will help you as well to you know discover and you're not really force feeding that thing to the child correct and actually to <laughs> that you said about elevators but math is there everywhere it's all around you in this thing so there is one sun one moon so many stars many you can start with these there are a lot of uh, uh, tricks like this so uh, tanya says what kind of books can we buy for a 7 month uh, old baby for language development uh books are not really a thing required for 7 months you uh, they they'll be more interested in you know if if it's a book made of paper they'll probably tear it off and uh, because that that's more fun for them uh yeah but objects probably hold their interest better and or you know pictures maybe if you have these thick cardboard picture books but still 7 months is a bit early you know 9 months 10 months i would say you know give them picture books and they let it split through them mm-hmm. uh, or so, or you know using pictures i don't think books books per se will i think you're talking about giving the child the books but the mother can keep reading to the baby you can you yeah. say any time at like even, yeah. but at 7 months uh, their attention span is quite small to frankly follow a book but yeah they are uh, happy when you label stuff yeah they they like uh, that activity where you know you're labeling pointing labeling pointing that just that system is fun enough for them yeah so they are okay so, with that yeah correct so maybe you can have a book and you know just talk about what do you see in it may the, the yeah, child may not yeah. follow the story as such as you're saying but uh, you know you can evolve your own story and any kind of book which has lots love of facial pictures. expressions so yeah, it, absolutely there are books where there are you know this crying yeah. and happy and jumping and excited and Make you can space yeah. along with the okay. thinking the book they'll actually have a lot of fun you can even use puppets uh, you know yeah. hand puppets finger puppets use that we have this in our babbler box as well and we encourage uh, you know parents to do the story time with uh, these kind of props and all so it helps a lot because the child remembers these things you born through stories so you can uh, be very innovative creative okay punita is saying my child is 16 months uh, old he understands everything and tries his best to make us understand uh, but he is still into bob- babbling 
is it something to worry 16 months old again i need to know more about this because uh, by babbling what is it that the ch- parents are considering as babbling because at 16 months sometimes jargon speech is there and if it is jargon then you know it's just a matter of time that he'll push on to speech yeah. for parents jargon, uh, jargon and babbling becomes babbling only they don't really uh-huh. differentiate in that so this needs a little more information again correct yeah so ripika i think she is asking the question again he speaks only 30 words in total it's unclear 2.7 years of age uh, so maybe let's ask this uh, around 3 years what ideally can be the vocabulary not ideally let's say it will be average. huge it will be huge there will be in the count of hundreds of yeah i'm years. sure it should be at least yeah. i would i would say 1000 to 1500 words should yeah. be there. in understanding it will be around that and in speaking it should be more than more ah. than 200 words yeah uh, in in this is again you know clarity wise i would say that at 2.7 they are unclear most mm-hmm. of them are mm-hmm. unclear you will not really always understand what a 2.3 year old is also saying right so clarity wise i would say but again you know if she is so insistent on it i i really need to understand what she means by unclear okay yeah okay and okay. in terms of speaking 30 words only if that's a small vocabulary then again why correct yeah. but talk to her more i guess you if you uh, ripika if you keep talking to your baby and others also in the house who are talking i think it will uh, uh, you should expose the child more to uh, words if she and... has if if she can provide some more specific information about how the child is has how the milestones have been and how the child has grown and even the 30 words that he learned how did he what are the words that he has learned yeah. all that information will help yeah helping her better so if she can sure. put in sure. a question query that's fine so that can be on a one to one we can share yeah. uh, punam's number if uh, at the end of the session so upasna says my baby is 4.5 months and everyone in the family speaks to him a lot that's great especially in bengali kannada english is it okay at this age or will he get confused can he differentiate the sounds now okay i think uh, at 4.5 months they are not really differentiating speech sounds by then uh, they are able to understand that you know they have probably associated certain sounds or certain word, words which they're not words for them but a bunch of sounds together means this this is what it is when these sounds come yeah uh, they're not very they will not specifically understand that this is bengali this is kannada this is kannada mm-hmm. this is english that won't be happening at 4.5 months um if there are three languages that the child is being exposed to uh let it be the native speaker and again let them speak clearly and in complete sentences in that particular language yeah Yeah, that's yeah. that's the most important thing i would say I, i think up to six languages is fine but it should be the native speaker not somebody else trying to imitate those words that's very and bad. at 4.5 at least right now the child is not you know he's more into communicating than he's into absorbing speech it's when they turn 6 months is when you start seeing uh, you know ah, correct speech step in and that's when you keep a check as to whether this whole thing has made any difference to the child or not hmm correct so lavi says my baby is 7 months old uh, what what we can communicate or talk to make her ready uh, early speak to make her to speak early yeah all uh, you do yeah punam go ahead please yeah uh, yeah you can what are you saying something no i was just saying all the conversations the reading everything that you're doing with your child is preparing her for speaking yeah Isn't it? and there is no speak early your baby is going to speak when the baby is ready to speak yeah. <laughs> have patience um it it is uh, overwhelming for babies if we you know really uh, the thing is okay let me put it like this the mother's anxiety the baby's anxiety hmm. <laughs> if the mother is anxious the baby will know correct so it's necessary for you to relax and let this thing unfold because it's like a mystery for you and it's an one time experience for both of you all the hmm. baby is never going to be seven months again and you know it's it's Sorry. just enjoy the whole ride absolutely she will yeah. speak so you can continue doing what you're doing if the inputs are right and everything is fine with the baby then the baby will speak just trust in your baby that whatever you're talking the baby is just absorbing and there will be a time when uh, she will surprise you so vrushali says how should we keep children away from tv or mobile while eating or should we expose them to should we not expose them to screen I think we have de- delved on this for quite some time now so I think we'll proceed to the next one uh Kushbu says thanks with your answer 
got a different perspective of what I think. Okay, great. Good to know that. Um, Asunta says, my struggle for every day with my 22 month old without the screen. Um, um, see, I think, you know, I mean, uh, let me put it like this. When I was to be a first time mother, I was like, you know, you, you want the best for your first child, right? You want to learn everything, know everything, be the perfect parent. Some kids are handful. You really don't know what to do with them. And when all your energy has run out, you know, the, the temptation of picking the screen, handing it to them and taking a breath is very strong. I can completely understand that. I had a younger one who was like that. I used to get exasperated. Okay, so I understand where you come from. But the decision of not having a screen in front of the child is not just the decision of not having a screen in front of the child. It's a practice that the whole family follows. Absolutely. Correct. So everybody doesn't sit in front of the screen during lunch or during dinner. Everybody sticks to having a limited number of screen time. Yes. The children will the children are copycats they will copy exactly what you do so you watch less they will watch less okay this is only till they turn eight okay after that they don't they become their own selves and they can't they start forming their own ways of doing things so if you want to really form a habit early on in life for them is really great because by eight the habits become strong correct and it's yeah. not very easy to break it they're still moldable but you know the basic habits are set in correct so I, I would encourage parents to, uh, you know, hold their will. If mm. they decided that it's going to be a no screen thing, you will have to figure out things to do with your child. Children yeah. are like, uh, you know, they're like uh, um, caterpillars. They want to voraciously devour everything that's in their way. Learn this, touch this, open this, close this. It's a big thing for Correct. them. And uh, yeah. I think, as you said very rightly, and Rishali's question is also pertinent to that only. So if all of you as a family follow this routine of not uh, uh, sitting in front of the TV, I'm sure the child will uh, learn from it. They should. So you, I think you must tell your uh, family members to support you by not uh, watching TV while eating food. I, think I have helpful. a lot of parents who come and say, my husband doesn't do it. My in-laws don't do it. My, or my oh. parents don't do it. Yeah, it's it's your household that you run, and there is one rule that you set, and you have to let, you have to all get on the same page. Yes, you're doing it for the next generation, so let's do it right. Correct. And okay. it it can be explained. I you know every every person has this issue at home where everybody has different TV times. Like you know, especially dads and moms who are working, the only time they get in front of the TV is when they putting food into yeah. their tummies. Other than that, they're you know really occupied. So I completely understand that, yeah. but. It would really make a difference if you do this today. Tomorrow, your kids are going to pass that habit on to the next generation. So it's like, you know, it's it's uh, leading by example. Hmm. So right. The way to do it is you get everybody on the same page. Right. So I think now we are taking a detour. I wouldn't like to go on the topic of food. Lavi is asking what is the right way to solid feed for seven months. Uh, I think this is not connected with the topic right now. Please, Lavi, if, uh, you know, we, maybe we can take this question a little later on time so we'll respect our uh, experts expertise and we'll ask her related question so um, hari priya is asking kya uh, kya bachcho ko khate time hum book de sakte hai are mera baby book dek, dekhte hi khata hai i think that's a similar question let's not uh, yeah. one more thing is since he is very small uh, when i tell him stories concentration span is less he looks away. So what is the correct age to introduce stories? Again, I'm sorry, Upasna, this uh, is again related to that storytelling and all that. We have done one uh, session. I, I will send you the link uh, to that storytelling session. Um, it's there on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can have a look at that. I think uh, Surekha ma'am has explained very nicely there. Um, Neha is asking, hello, ma'am, my child is of 13 months. How can I teach him to learn, recognize organs? Another thing, okay. Body parts. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Related to body parts. Huh. I think a basic rhyme for head, shoulder, knees, and toes, or you know, <laughs> nose, eyes, that helps. But I don't think at thirteen months they would anyways be able to recognize all the body parts. At max, they can tell you hands, legs, nose. Mouth, Actually, uh, Neha, very interestingly, and Poonam, you know, we have in our uh, uh, Babler box, we have a, a huge a box in which one of the activities is a body puzzle book 
So mm. in that we've provided a jigsaw kind of a puzzle, which the uh, baby said, there's a book and a puzzle inside. Yeah. So first uh, the external body parts, uh, child as a game to identify that. And then inside there's a jigsaw puzzle. So when you open it, all the systems and all also there. So it becomes, if you make a fun activity of it, probably the child uh, can pick it up. But uh, mm -hmm. as you said, yeah, I mean, that's like again. if the child is really interested in puzzles, I think the child would, you know, give this. But for, if you ask me for a generic proper yeah. population of 13 month olds, Absolutely. then they would love to, you know, point it on their body ah, you can hmm. do it while having a bath. So, you know, that's 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 how they yeah. are able to actually guess it on their body. Yeah. Because they still not learn to look at correct, correct. away from their body. Correct. Yeah. And like you said, head, shoulder, knees and toes, that thing itself, that rhyme is such a catchy rhyme. So yeah. that's a good one to have. So, um, yeah, so Lavi is asking, can you share feeding relevant session link as well? Uh, okay. So, uh, so we have these sessions, I think uh, uh, we have done them. These are live sessions actually. And it's not like every time, I mean, immediately they are uh, put onto our YouTube channel, but uh, uh, all our Babylo parents uh, can join the session. Uh, we tell them about it when the sessions are, uh, they are um, on the third Thursday of uh, every month. So maybe Lavi, probably you joined in later on, I suppose. So we'll, uh, we'll check uh, whether we can send you that recording. Uh, I guess most of the questions that parents have asked, I think we have answered. Uh, I think so. Yeah, okay. So Neha says it's keen to find out why to get free session. Look, uh, it seems if you wanted to look the recorded session, it takes much time to publish from your size. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, so it's not that it takes time. Basically, we are offering these live sessions. These are our live parenting sessions where you can actually interact with the expert. So that's the whole idea of uh, these uh, vision pack sessions. So uh, rather than looking at the recording, what will be more interesting is where you can uh, come and join these sessions and actually ask questions to our expert. You know, that's the whole idea of uh, providing these sessions. Um, yeah, we'll share this YouTube uh, channel name uh, as well with you. If you look on the YouTube, uh, uh, just go to YouTube and search for Babler, Babler Early Learning, you will find it. Okay, so that's, uh, I think we've uh, addressed most of the questions. Um, okay, so there is one thing um, I would like to, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Asuntha, that's nice of you to uh, say this and we will share more sessions with you. Okay, so um, I would like to, uh, I think there are both Babler parents as well as non-Babler parents here. So I would like to share some very good news. So we are going live with Babler 2. What you'll have been using is Babler 1. And in the next few days, we are going to come out with Babler 2. And, uh, uh, you know, Babler 2, what it has is it's got a fresh and a friendlier user interface is very uh, nice. Uh, there are more developmental activities. Then we have some very new, exciting new features are there. Then there is a milestone tracker. There are dedicated parenting sessions. Um, so it's a, it's a world-class experience that we are bringing to you and all existing users will be, um, you know, getting a free upgrade. So there is a big surprise with Babler 2, which will, which we will really uh, reveal at the uh, time of the launch and we will send you a message before going live. So I, uh, so wait for it. You all are going to really uh, enjoy Babler 2. So on that note, I would uh, really like to thank Poonam. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, you shared some wonderful insights with us and uh, we will share your number. Uh, do you want to put your number in the chat if uh, just in case some of the parents who were interested? Uh, I in would like to share my email ID. Huh, that would be and good. And then parents can mail it in and if required, I'll share my number then. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good, I mean, that's all. Uh, yeah, I'll just do that. So just in case uh, they would like to, like some of them had very specific questions, so maybe they can, uh, you know. So I, I guess. Uh, That's my mail ID. Yeah, okay. great. Yeah, great. So you can just take a note of this uh, email address. And uh, so thank you parents for uh, joining us. It was a lot of questions you all had. Uh, sorry, some of the questions uh, which were not connected with the topic, we did not answer. Uh, 
but if you can suggest, you all can in the feedback form that's there, you all can suggest some other ideas and topics that you would like us to take up. Uh, so we'll try to bring you sessions like that. And remember, these are live sessions. So rather than the recording, I urge you all to attend the live sessions. Okay. So thank you, Poonam. Thank you very much for this session. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. So great then. Everybody have a great time and uh, happy weekend, I would say. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.